Hey guys, Sam from West Meadow Rabbits here, and today I want to talk about protein poisoning, the mysterious condition that will kill you if you eat meat rabbits. If you saw my video talking about meat rabbits versus chickens when it comes to meat production, you probably know that it was a little controversial if you made your way down to the comments. I got a lot of comments from people, some well-meaning, some less so, and a lot of the more interesting ones were talking about how you need to be careful when eating meat rabbits because if you just ate the rabbit meat you were going to get this condition called protein poisoning and we're probably going to die. Today I want to break that claim down and kind of highlight how protein poisoning is not really a thing. Just a quick side note before we jump into it. The background looks different because I am at West Meadow Rabbit's new location. I had an announcement video over here that I published last week, you can catch all the details there, but long story short, we're at a new location, it's five times the size of our old location, it's going to take us a while to move here, but a lot of exciting stuff is coming. Now without further ado, let's talk about protein poisoning. Put simply, rabbit starvation is a slang term, kind of a wives tale that is a name for a very real condition called protein poisoning, also known by a bunch of other names including mal de caribou, indicating that it is really nothing to do with rabbits. It's an acute condition that develops when the vast overwhelming majority, we're probably talking like 99% plus, of your calories comes from exclusively protein. Now this is not the same thing as meat. You're all probably familiar with the big three macronutrient categories, protein, fat, and carbs. And we tend to think of meat when we think of protein, but that's not actually that accurate. Meat, as some of you may know, also has fat, and even depending on the meat and cut, may also have trace amounts of carbohydrates. A very fatty cut of meat, say like a piece of beef, will have a lot more fat in it than a leaner cut of meat, like chicken breast. But all meat does have some fat in it. That being said, these different macronutrient groups are broken down and metabolized differently by the body, and each of them has certain effects. Now, protein is not dangerous for you to consume. Now, I'm sure the carnivores and vegans will have a heyday with this, but the reality is there's no strong evidence that suggests there's an upper amount of protein that you can eat that will cause you harm. Certainly not an upper amount of protein that you would be able to eat under normal circumstances. I mean, personally, I've done the carnivore diet, and I found it hard enough to just keep eating that much meat, and even then, you would have to eat significantly more before you ran into problems. The reason protein poisoning exists is because it's a very unique situation where you are eating meat, but that meat has no fat in it, which means to get your daily intake of, let's say, around 2,000 calories without any fat content, you have to eat a ton of protein to try to make up for that. So, so far so good, but I think it's really important to highlight that this condition is mind-blowingly rare. Historically, there are only a few examples of it ever happening, and it's only ever happened in incredibly unusual circumstances. Just to give you an idea of how rare this condition is, I combed through the internet to try to find some examples of modern protein poisoning in a healthy individual taking place, and I could not find anything in the medical literature. Historically, this condition has really only ever taken place if you're a frontiersman, an arctic explorer, or sometimes stranded in the wilderness, typically in the winter, when your only source of food is game animals. So not just rabbits, right off the bat, that's an incorrect uh, statement when people call it rabbit starvation, because this can happen with any wild animal. The reason that these game animals can cause protein poisoning is because in the winter, particularly hard winters, or if you're exploring above the arctic circle, you're going to find these animals, they're also going to be starving because it's the winter and there's absolutely no food available. I mean, think about it. If you're in the wilderness and you cannot find a single drop of food except animals, things have probably gotten pretty bad. It's probably a very hard winter. Of course, one of the most common and easy to catch animals in most environments, including, say, the Arctic tundra, is rabbits or hares. Hence why the term rabbit starvation began to be passed down through the generations. But it's really important to point out that the rabbit has nothing to do with it. This could happen with literally any animal, even cows, for example. If you were out in a grassland and there was a you know, drought and you were eating starving cows, you could still get protein poisoning. Now it comes to the point where we can totally debunk the term rabbit starvation. Let's just look at some evidence, okay? Rabbits are animals, they're not some foreign alien, and all animals can store fat in their bodies. Rabbits can and do store fat just like any other animal. Now where they're different from say a fatty cut of beef is that they don't store fat inside of their muscle tissue. So when you see marbled beef or pork, that's because those animals store fat within the muscle tissue. Rabbits don't do that. However, they do store fat in their 
bodies. If you've seen my video on butchering meat rabbits, you can see there's large deposits of fat above the shoulders, there's fat along the belly, there's a ton of fat inside the body cavity around the kidneys, there's fat all over the place. It's just not in the meat itself. The most important thing though is that domesticated rabbits are not the same species as what these explorers were eating when they got protein poisoning. The American cottontail is a totally different species than the domesticated rabbit. And I don't just mean because it's domesticated. All domestic rabbits are descended from the European rabbit. It's one species of rabbit in a very specific location. Now they've been spread throughout the world, but they are not the same species as an American cottontail or a hare or the various other species of rabbits that you would find throughout the world. And the differences go even further than that. The domesticated rabbit is very, very different from the wild European rabbit. Just like, say, a modern Rhode Island red is very different than the red jungle fowl in the jungles of Southeast Asia, or the modern Holstein Frisian dairy cow looks almost nothing like the oryx that were roaming Europe 10,000 years ago. Domestication very much changes an animal, so much so that we can see it measurably in the nutrition contents. If we look at domesticated rabbits versus wild rabbit versus a couple different parts of chickens, the USDA compares them side by side, apples to apples, all of them raw, all of it 100 grams, and we can see the exact nutrient breakdown. If we look at domesticated rabbit, we can see that a 100 grams of various parts of the rabbit, you know, kind of cut randomly, is going to have 20 grams of protein and 5.5 grams of fat. Now we can compare that to the wild rabbit, which has slightly more protein at 21.8 grams, but less than half of the fat at 2.32 grams of fat. Now this should be very obvious to anybody watching, that is rabbits under the best circumstances. When those wild rabbits are starving, they'll have even less fat on them. So when we're looking at a healthy domesticated rabbit raised in your homestead or farm, it's going to have maybe four or five times as much fat as its wild counterpart. So there is absolutely no reason why you wouldn't be able to get enough fat from a domesticated rabbit. And I can tell you for a fact that one of the biggest issues we have as breeders of rabbits is that rabbits get too fat. They get obese. And if they get obese, they won't breed. However, you're gonna have plenty of fat for whatever you might need that for. Now, I'm not saying rabbit fat is the most appealing fat or the most useful for cooking. I don't think it is, but it's more than enough to survive off of because again, a domesticated rabbit is a totally different animal. Now for more comparison's sake, let's compare domesticated rabbit to chicken. If we look at a domesticated chicken, which for the USDA's purposes is a Cornish cross industry hen, which in and of itself is fatter than many of the other breeds of chicken, 100 grams of that chicken is gonna have 22.5 grams of protein, but only 1.93 grams of fat. So a chicken breast actually has almost three times less fat than a random piece of rabbits, although it does have slightly more protein. Now, of course, to be fair, 100 grams of chicken thigh does have a different nutrient breakdown. The thigh would have 18.6 grams of protein and 7.92 grams of fat per 100 grams of chicken thigh. And both of these comparisons were assuming that the skin was off of the animal. Eating chicken with the skin on will add significantly to its fat content. However, eating rabbit with the skin on will also add to its fat content. The point though is that on domesticated chickens, the largest piece of meat is the breast. And the breast is actually much, much less fatty than rabbit meat. So if we average out the fat content of a chicken, it is roughly comparable to a domesticated rabbit. The evidence is pretty clear. Chicken does not have much more fat than rabbit. We can look at all four of them compared right here and see very easily that domesticated rabbit has almost two times more fat than wild rabbit, which when people were getting rabbit starvation eating that wild rabbit, those rabbits themselves were starving and probably had far less fat than even that. And we can see that domesticated rabbit has three times as much fat as chicken breast, which is the largest cut of meat on a chicken. The point here being that domesticated rabbit by itself has more than enough fat to survive on if you want to eat it 365 days a year, seven days a week for every single one of your meals. Now this brings me to my last point about rabbits prepping and self-reliance. I really think a lot of the people in the prepping community are somewhat responsible for spreading this wives tale. Now it's true if you're going to bug out to the wilderness and try to survive off the land you need to be aware of rabbit starvation but you also need to be aware of any of the game animals you might be trying to survive off of could cause this condition. But for homesteaders or anybody who is planning on producing their own food this is really a non-issue. We can easily see based on the USDA facts that the idea that chicken has somehow more fat than rabbit or that domesticated rabbit doesn't have enough fat is objectively false. 
And we also know that if you've raised Babbitt before, you can fatten them up as much as you like. And I've covered at length on this channel how easy it is for a homesteader to feed rabbits exclusively from their land. As I pointed out before, if we look at this field behind me, it's going to be winter. There's not a lot of food out there. There's no way a chicken would be able to survive in this area without supplemental feeding, whether that's food scraps or something else. The reality is you couldn't do it. On the other hand, you can see in front of me all these dried leaves, some still green grass, plenty of trees with stuff on them. It is very much possible to feed a rabbit off of this land, many, many rabbits off of this land without any issues throughout even a harsh winter. Furthermore, it'd be easy enough to save a lot of these leaves and hay this field and have more than enough food again through the winter. Those rabbits would be able to get fat off of that food and produce more meat per square foot of living space and more meat per pound of food eaten than any other animal except the Cornish Cross. And as we've talked about before, if you're concerned about prepping, survivability, or sustainability, you ain't gonna be raising the Cornish Cross because those industry hatcheries aren't gonna be operating, there's no truck to bring it to you, and there's no grain farms to get feed from. And a final point I wanna to touch on specifically related to prepping, there seems to be a lot of delusions in that community about what kind of scenario they're looking to survive. If you wanna get out of the city and get on a homestead and raise 50, maybe even 90% of your food, that's totally fine. You absolutely can do that, and I strongly recommend it. Rabbits would be a great part of that. But you're not going to survive the apocalypse on your homestead, and you're certainly not going to have to be worrying about whether you should be raising chickens or rabbits. Now, if we get another pandemic or even a war with instability, um, it's good to have a homestead and be able to produce your food. I have some friends in Ukraine who homestead, uh, and it's been very useful due to the instability there. In any remotely normal situation, even if your rabbits were starving for some reason, you could walk out to a woods and get some acorns and hickory nuts. You could grow some root vegetables. There would be no situation where you'd have domesticated rabbits and no other food source. So guys, if you see anybody on YouTube or commenting in the forums that you shouldn't raise meat rabbits because you're gonna die of rabbit starvation, they have no idea what they're talking about. Unless you're planning an expedition to go explore the Arctic Circle, you will have no issues with domesticated meat rabbits. They are a great source of meat, protein, fat, whatever, you name it. You can't go wrong with them. Rabbit starvation is not something you should be worried about. It is something you will never encounter in your entire life. I guarantee it. If anything, it's an exaggerated wives' tales, but today we've completely debunked it. So go ahead and get those meat rabbits. And if you see anybody talking about rabbit starvation, go ahead and send them over this video. So Either way, guys, I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or clarifications, leave a comment below. I'm linking to all the sources in the description. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Share it with your skeptical friends. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.